let me just give you the title first. I just simply called it and titled it Growth, Faith, uh, Fruitfulness, and Maturity. Okay? Growth, Fruitfulness, and Maturity. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, uh, we know that these that we see up here behind me are your will for us. You want us to grow, you want us to be fruitful, and you want us to mature. Now show us, Lord, how you work this out in our lives because we are all called to this and we just want to be able to understand your ways in this kingdom as we navigate through life, O oh Lord, and, 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 and have to deal with many issues that come our way, whether it be on a personal level, family level, health level, uh, business, job, schooling, whatever it is, Lord, you cause all things to work together for our good. And our good is always to draw closer to you and become more like you. So show us, Lord, and I pray that this will come forth clearly, that we might all understand your work in us, uh, to us, and eventually through us. May you be exalted and glorified in all this, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Okay, um, I want to do something a little different in the sense that uh, I want to be able to change gears a little bit, if you understand that expression. You know, this last several weeks, I've been talking about the blessing of God and how He wants to bless us, and that's so true. I really believe that with all my heart, okay? But the blessing is not the primary goal of God, okay? The blessing that He wants to pour out into your life. He wants to do it, but that's not his goal. And there are, there are things that he wants to do far greater than just blessing us. Okay? And I want to be able to focus on that today. And uh, it's, it's really to sort of bring a greater sense of wholeness to the messages that I've been preaching over the past, what, two months now, I think. Okay? And so... Uh, Let's look at this. In Genesis chapter 12, most of us, we probably even memorized this already. It says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in, all, uh, uh, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Okay. Now, clearly in this verse, this was given to Abraham for those of you that have encountered this passage, uh, this was given to Abraham. God had just called Abraham out of his people, and he said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to bless you. Okay? I have a purpose for all of this. And eventually, as you read his story, and going all the way to the New Testament, you will find that, that Abraham is the father of our faith. He, we connect to him because he came, he predated the law given through Moses. He came about uh, well, a couple of hundred years before, before uh, Moses. And so um, the law was not yet given. God had given a promise. And God said that the law will never supersede the promise. The law was given for a season until the seed should come. That's Jesus Christ. So the law has an expiration date. And Jesus came to go back to the promise and bring us back to the promise because by the law no man will be saved, he said. Okay? Now, clearly in this passage we see here, God wants to bless us. And many times we... Um, underestimate the capacity of God to be able to bless us. And so we worry, will we ever be blessed? Will I ever get my healing? Will I ever get my breakthrough? Will I be able to get out of my present circumstance or situation? And, and um, God, God's resources are so unlimited, His power so almighty that really nothing is too difficult for Him. Okay? And He does want to bless us. However, His end game is not that you will be blessed. That's not His, that's not his goal, that you will be blessed. But rather that you will be a blessing. 
He said, I will bless you. You see it here. I will bless you and you shall be a blessing. So he wants to bless you first so that you can be a blessing. It's not just, I will bless you, period. Okay? In other words, if that were the case, then that's it. You get blessed. God has achieved his purpose as far as your life is concerned. But he said, no, I'm going to bless you because here's the thing. I want you to be a blessing to other people. And because I want them to know how good I am through you. And so we cannot be the end of our prayer. Lord, just bless me. Bless me with much. Bless me with healing. Bless me with deliverance. Bless me with money. Bless me with happiness and joy and goodness and favor and peace and all of that. And he does want to do that, but the prayer cannot end with us. Because then you're going, to be, you're going to be seeing only one half of the equation. You cannot have simply one plus one, and you don't put anything on the other side of the equal sign. Because then it, by itself, it does not make sense. It's half a sentence. And when you don't have the other side, it doesn't balance out the equation. I want to bless you. That's one side. But the reason is so you can be a blessing. That completes what God wants to do through you. And until you see that other side, well, until we see the other side, we will, the blessing, one, the blessing may elude us, but because God is good, He'll still bless, but not to the extent that He wants to. Number two, uh, because it does not balance out, the blessing will not make sense, and when it does not make sense, we will abuse the blessing. Some people cannot handle the blessing and it destroys them. You've heard so many stories of people that became so successful and then they got into vice or whatever and it destroyed them. Why? They did not have the understanding of the purpose of blessing. They simply said, I want to be blessed. And then that's it. Now, three things... I want you to understand three things that God wants to do to you and then through you. And you see that already in the title of my message, Growth, Fruitfulness, and Maturity. And we're going to deal with that one by one. The first one is growth. Okay? The first one is growth. God calls us to be fruitful, but first you must be planted. See, a tree cannot grow until a seed is planted. Amen? Until you are planted, that seed, the Bible says, Jesus said, abides alone. It stays by itself. The potential of the seed will never, ever come forth until it is planted. Now, the Bible tells us that we are a planting of the Lord. In Isaiah 61, it says to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees. That they may be called trees. Now, the fruit of the tree is righteousness. So they are trees of righteousness. Listen to this. The planting of the Lord, and here's the purpose, that He may be glorified. So, that's talking about us, okay? He wants to do this. You are now going to be called trees of righteousness, but before you can become a tree, you start out a seed, right? Makes sense. You start out a seed, so now you have to be a planting of the Lord. So now God will plant you. Okay? He has to plant you. And this speaks of planting you into His kingdom. In other words... Everyone that is not yet planted in Christ is a seed, and the full potential of that seed will never be realized until you are first planted in Christ. Until then, you will never see. Now, you might become successful as far as the world defines success, you know, you might have the money, the cars, the houses. You might have, you know, all of these other trappings that are external. But you will never really begin to maximize yourself because you remain unplanted. And so the seed abides alone. The first thing you need is to come into the kingdom. That's where you are 
planted. Now, here's the thing about planting. The seed doesn't choose where to be planted. The gardener does, right? If he says, this mango seed, which will become one day a mango tree, I'll just throw it wherever, and wherever it falls, that's where it will grow. That's usually not what he does, because what if it falls in the middle of your driveway? Nothing's going to happen to that seed. He has to intentionally dig a hole and plant that seed in a place of his choice. That's why we are a planting of the Lord. And that's why when you and I bring people to Christ, we need to invite them to service. And not just say, well, you know, just wherever. It doesn't matter. They're not going to grow. They need to be planted. And that's very important. Now, if, for example, you're on vacation, you know, and you go to a different place where you don't live and you don't go to church there because you're from here, you know, maybe you go to Davao, you go to Hong Kong or whatever, and in the process, you win someone to Christ, help them look for a church. Don't just say, well, you're already saved, you know, just God bless you. No, help them as far as you are able, help them. If you have to go on the internet and look for a church, you know, and check out the church. Is this a good church? You know, is their theology good? Is the, do they have care groups so that you will be discipled properly and so on? And these are ways of ensuring that this seed, that, that you know, God used you to bring some a seed into the ground. It's still God who saves, not you and me. But he used us. What a privilege. Now, let's not abort that seed by just saying, wherever you want to go. Okay? We need to be planted. And just like a plant, a plant doesn't decide on its own, I will uproot myself. You know, because I, I, I know the gardener planted me here, but I don't like it here. The view is nicer over there. I, I want to transfer over there. And so the plant just gets up and crawls on its leaves, right? And just goes to this other side and say, well, I, I like it better here, so I'm going to dig a hole. I'll stick my roots in. I'll cover it, and this is where I'll be, okay? Plants don't do that, okay? I don't know if you noticed, but if you ever have a favorite tree, you know, or something maybe in your house, uh, we have this tree in our farm. My Lolo planted it about 100 years ago, okay? And it's a big acacia tree. Uh, the last time I went to the farm, it's still there. Yeah, it's still there. I, I'm not worried that one day I'll wake up and it'll be on the other side of the house. You know? First of all, it's so big. We planted it. Uh, we, we built a tree house. My dad, actually, built a tree house there. And we can fit 25 people in that tree house. That's how big that tree is, you know. And, and um, ever since I was a kid, that tree was already there. I mean, all my life, the tree was grown up. I never saw it grow. My Lolo, my dad's dad, was the one that planted that there when he was a little kid. You know, so that tree is over 100 years old. And you know why? Here's a miracle. It's still there. You know, it's still there. Even if the tree says, you know, I really, the tree's up there. You know, so I really don't like it here. Well, tough. That's where my Lolo planted you. <laughs> You're going to stay there. You know, the tree does, just doesn't uproot itself. It submits itself to the hands of the gardener. Right? See? And that's where you grow. That's, sorry, that's where you grow. God, you have to trust God that He knows where to plant you so that you can bloom. Now, the reason why we become a little um, disappointed okay, in God's plan is because we are still very me-centered. Okay? God put us in a certain place. For you, it's here. Okay? Put you in a certain place, not just so that you will have a nice view and you will be planted, but because you have certain gifts, talents, and abilities that are perfect right here in this place. In other words, we have to have a mindset of giving to others instead of receiving from others. Okay? Now, receiving is needed. I'm not saying it's sin to receive. We need to receive because you cannot give what you don't have. That's why God wants to bless you. See, and he will start by blessing you, but that's not the end. The end is so you will be a blessing 
too many. Amen? So He knows where to plant you. Jeremiah 17, 8 says, For He shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river, and it will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Now, here's a... I love this passage, you know. I really love this, part this particular verse. Look at this. How do you know that you're planted in the right place, okay? Let me give you a few clues. The Bible here tells us behind in, in Jeremiah 17, 8, that you will be planted by waters, okay? In other words, God knows where to plant you. And where you are, you will be nourished, okay? That's why you are planted by the waters. You will be nourished. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes... It doesn't feel that way. You know, have you ever experienced praying and it seems like heaven is shut? Am I the only one? <laughs> See, we've experienced that, right? You've been praying, 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 but your situation goes from bad to worse. Have you ever? You know, it's like, Lord, I think you hit reverse here. <laughs> you know, the first time I drove an automatic car, you know, I was always manual, right? And there were letters. I'm used to seeing numbers on the cambio. Right? One, two, three, four, five, R. But here it was P, R, N, D. It's like, what's all this, you know? P is first gear. <laughs> I mean, why not F, right? And so somebody was teaching me, oh no, P is park. D is drive. N is neutral. And this friend of mine said, an R is race. <laughs> so I kicked it into R and stepped on the gas. Can you imagine how surprised I was that the car was not going in the direction I thought it should go? Now, my ignorance is not an excuse. The car was designed to work a certain way. I can think R is race all I like. And I said, why didn't they use B for backup? Reverse doesn't make sense. B, backup, that makes sense, you know? So I thought, you know, reverse, rewind, and all that stuff like that. But anyway, you know, sometimes it doesn't feel like you're going in the right direction. Sometimes it feels like God forgot your address. But He knows where He planted you. And it's always by the rivers. It's always by the rivers. Here's the thing. In the beginning, it might feel like things are going well. Somewhere in the middle, it's like God forgot you. But if you can, if you can wait that out, you'll find that God is faithful. Amen? He really is. Here's another sign. You will not fear when heat comes. You will not fear when heat comes. Heat speaks of persecution. It speaks of trials and troubles and, 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 and difficult times. The Bible says that the seed, was planted in, the seed that was planted in shallow ground, it quickly dried up when the sun rose. And Jesus explained in Matthew 13 that, that the sun, that's persecution. So there will be tough times, it says there. But the Bible says you will not fear when the tough times come. Oh yes, it might be uncomfortable. It might even be painful. But you will not fear. See, why? Because when you're planted in the right place, you will be equipped. You will be able to, uh, you will have what it takes to face whatever comes. Amen? And then it says, but its leaf will be green. It doesn't say, but its leaf hopefully, might be green. No, it will be. Green leaves speak of health. It speaks of life. In other words, you will be healthy, primarily spiritually, healthy regardless of the time and season of life. In the dry times, you will be green. In the rainy days, you will be green.
In the sunny days, you will be green. In the tough times, you will be green. In other words, your health is rooted in Christ and not based on the niceness of your situation. You are not easily swayed to and fro by the things that are happening around you because the Bible says that the Lord establishes His people. So you are firmly established. Amen? The seasons may change. Amen. The seasons may change. The winds may change. It's not always sunny. But you will always be green. Amen. You will always be green. So your health, the greenness, your health is connected to the soil. As long as you're connected to the soil, you're going to be okay. The problem is when you take the plant out of the soil. It cannot survive outside of the soil. So turn to your neighbor right now and just say, stay planted. <laughs> stay rooted, amen? Don't run away from your troubles. Troubles have an expiration date. You are eternal in Christ, amen? So don't worry about it, amen? The Bible also says that you will not be anxious in a year of drought. In other words, in the place where you're planted, you will be courageous. You will not be anxious. And not because you're in a good place, but because you are in good hands. Amen? You are in good hands. Jesus knows how to take care of you. The situations will change. It will not always be favorable winds. Sometimes storms come. But you will learn how to walk by faith. Amen? And then it says, nor will cease from yielding fruit. In other words, you will always be fruitful. Regardless of the season, you will always be fruitful. And in fact, God wants you to be abundantly fruitful. Not just fruitful, abundantly fruitful. Now, let me please just say this. Being fruitful does not mean problem-free. Okay, it doesn't mean problem-free. God wants you to be fruitful. Our context here is to be a blessing to others all the time, regardless of the season of life. Because to be a blessing, you just need to be a friend. To be blessed does not mean to have a lot of money. It can include that. But it means to be at peace. You can sleep well at night. You have joy in the midst of turmoil. You have joy. So many people, they have money, but they don't have peace of mind. That's not success. That's not success. And worse, some people don't have money and don't have peace of mind. That's worse. Diba? Pastor, okay na yung maraming pera, maski walang kapayapaan. You know, never mind, have a lot of money and no peace. Better than no money and no peace, I guess. But you see, God wants you to be blessed wall to wall. You know, everything. When, when you get squeezed, only blessing comes out. You know, you are so blessed that your blood, if they squeeze you, your words, your thoughts, everything about you, it's like, oh my gosh, God is blessing me. You know? You are just so blessed. You're so focused on God that even when the storm comes and starts slapping you around, you say, praise God, hallelujah. Amen? And it's possible. It is. See, here's the thing. You know, I was so amazed. God put this in my mind last night. Fruitfulness begins in the mind. See, we just finished fasting for 21 days. We've been believing God for breakthrough and deliverance and healing and so on and so forth, all of these things. And then just because we didn't get it yet with the 21 days over, then we change our mind. What happened? How come I'm not yet blessed? How come I'm not yet delivered? How come my case is not yet over? How come I still feel pain in my body? How come I still don't have money? How come I can't still sleep at night? And all of these things, everything begins in your mind. See, you have to go to God and say, you know what? It's not about what I feel. It's about who God is. And He is faithful. So it's just a matter of time. Amen? And you got to be stubborn in your mind. 
You got to be stubborn in your mind. I was just talking to someone this morning and she was getting a little discouraged, you know? And I said, there are two things that help me when, when things start coming against me and I'm starting to feel discouraged. I remember what the Lord spoke to me many, many years ago, a couple of decades ago. And He told me this, do not trespass into the property of discouragement. It's do not trespass. Don't go there. Don't step into the lawn of discouragement. Stay away from discouragement. In other words, discouragement is a choice. We choose to be discouraged because we look at the waves and take our eyes off of Jesus. And so we get discouraged. So we got to be focused on Christ. And the second thing I said is, you got to be stubborn. You got to be stubborn. See, the devil will try and change your mind about God and say, where is your God now? I thought he said. I thought he would. What happened? And you got to be stubborn and say, you know what? My God's still going to bless me. My God is still good to me. It may not feel that way, but you got to be stubborn about that because God, see, this is what I said. Either God is a liar or the Bible is lying, or my situation has to change. If what God is saying and my situation are not the same, something has to change. But the Bible says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God will not change. And so my situation has to change. I said, and you got to be stubborn about that. you got to outlive. Your mind needs to outlive your problem. Don't let the problem change what you believe about who God is. God is good, period, all the time, period. No, exclamation point, mark. Amen? Don't change your mind. Wag pa bago-bago ang isip. Diba? I like how they say it in Bisaya. They would say it in English, do not two by two. Diba? Ayaw pa duha duha. Oh. Do not two by two. In other words, don't be double-minded. God is faithful or not faithful. Make up your mind, but you cannot. Row your boat in two rivers. It doesn't sound good in English, no? It's nicer in Tagalog. You cannot mamangka sa dalawang ilog. Diba? Yeah, it doesn't make sense. So, don't row your boat in two rivers. Or you will learn ballet and do the split. <laughs> you know, that's painful. Whew. Look at this. Psalm chapter 1 verse 3. He, that's you and me, shall be like a tree planted. See, God keeps on talking about planting. Okay? He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water that brings its fruit in its season. So you're going to be fruitful. Whose leaf also shall not wither. You'll always be green. And I love this. Whatever. Everyone say, whatever. Yes. Whatever he does shall prosper. prosper. Whatever he does shall prosper. Now here's the thing. Okay? I read the Bible and it says, whatever he does shall prosper. And then I look at my life and say, how come my life doesn't seem to be following that? And so now you have a slight dilemma. Either this is lying or my life has to change. See? But the thing that we need to understand is that when the Bible says prosper, it's not always about having good times. It's about to prosper scripturally means to be a blessing regardless of your situation. And that's something we need to understand. That's why whatever he does, it's not like, wow, I might as well get into business because I will be prosperous. Every business I start will make money. How many of us know that's not true? You will prosper in the area that God created you to be in. Not to do whatever you want to do. He's not obligated to prosper us to do what we want to do, but what he wants us to do. Amen? Amen? So the question is, do we really believe this? Or do we want to change the Word of God to fit our circumstances? And this is the trouble sometimes, trouble, if I can use quotation marks, this is the trouble sometimes when we teach faith. Because sometimes what you're saying doesn't match what you're experiencing. 
I'm healed. And then there's all of a sudden this sharp pain that hits you. Now, are you going to change the confession of your hope? The Bible says to hold fast the confession of your hope. See? I suppose that's why they call it faith. Believing what you still cannot see. Second thing he wants to do is fruitfulness. Now this is the tricky part, okay? It's fruitfulness. God is faithful to make us fruitful, but he has his way of making us fruitful. In fact, in the kingdom, there is only one way that God does it. It's called pruning. John 15, 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it might bear more fruit. First of all, we need to understand something about pruning. God only prunes His people. Every branch in me, in Christ. See? Now that means there will be branches that are not bearing fruit. And there will be branches that are bearing fruit. And so what he does is he prunes. The word prune means to cut away, to cut off, to excise, to take it away, to separate from the tree. That's what it means to prune. Now he does not prune the fruit because that would not be called pruning, it would be called harvesting. So he doesn't prune the fruit. He doesn't even prune the branches that have fruit. He prunes the branches that have no fruit. And it's not because He's mad at us for not bearing fruit. It's just that that area is taking much needed nutrients to bring to the fruit. So when He prunes, it's not because He's angry. He prunes because He is excited that you are bearing fruit. And He wants to help you become even more fruitful. Amen? That's the purpose of the pruning. However, and this is what I said, the tricky part, because pruning hurts. Pruning hurts. See, God is old-fashioned. He doesn't use anesthesia. Let's numb this branch first before I cut it off. You know, let's, let's numb this area of your life before I take it out. Usually, it's not the case. He just exercises his sovereignty and says, this is going to have to stop in your life. And it hurts. I remember when, when, when I stopped smoking, you know, God told me to stop smoking. He was pruning that out of my life because it was not beneficial to me. And he did it in such a way that from two packs a day to zero, cold turkey, overnight, and I never went back to cigarettes ever again. I felt no difficulty, there was no craving, no nothing, zero. Yeah, that was easy, it was sovereign. But when he told me to stop drinking, that was a little difficult. You know, I, my screwdriver tasted like turpentine. But because I really enjoyed drinking, I forced myself to drink this screwdriver that tasted like turpentine. I was a vodka drinker and tequila, and it started to taste really bad. And stopping was not easy, but it was not beneficial. He says, no, that needs to go. That needs to go. That's not going to help you become fruitful. So it means to cut away. He prunes the leaves and the stems, those things that are not bearing fruit. Anything that does not contribute to your calling, to your effectivity, to your purpose, to your destiny, He will take away. He is faithful. And these are not necessarily sinful things. They just don't contribute to what God has called you to do. See? God wants you to be focused. Life is too short. The devil wants to distract you. So the purpose of pruning is not just fruitfulness, but more fruitfulness. In other words, you're already fruitful because you're planted by the rivers. 
You're already fruitful. God made you fruitful. You were created fruitful. You are fruitful. Now God wants you to be more fruitful. And there's only one way. It's called pruning. Fruitful means productive, constructive, useful, worthwhile, helpful, beneficial, profitable, advantageous, successful, effective. These are all synonyms of fruitfulness. This is what God wants us to be. Anything that will take away from all this, God will take away from us. See, when a seed is planted, it requires a tremendous amount of care. You got to make sure there's enough sun, water, fertilizer, the soil is good, you know, and all of that. But the moment that seed becomes a tree, like that acacia tree I was talking about in our farm, my dad now who lives in our farm, he doesn't have to check on the tree and water it. He just leaves it by itself. We've got mango trees. You know, our mango trees, they just bear fruit every year. I don't know how many times a year, but whatever. The thing is, he doesn't have to put fertilizer. He doesn't have to get his watering can by the mango trees, you know, and, and water. He just leaves it alone. You know why? Because it has become more fruitful. In other words, it has matured. When you are still high maintenance, that's still immature. In other words, you don't know how to encourage yourself. You don't know how to pray. You don't know how to go into the Word and seek the Word. You don't know how to hear from God. And there's nothing wrong with that if you're still a baby Christian. But if you're 20 years old and you still get discouraged by the attacks of life and by the storms of life, it shows that, hey, we need to grow up here. We need to grow up because the immature, they're the ones that keep on falling down. And sometimes, you know, like with some plants, you got to put a stick and you, try, you tie it, right? Just so that it, because it doesn't have the strength to stay up. So you, you put that there until it gets strong enough, then you can take it out. Okay? That's the care group leader. So this is the way to grow. Now you stay by my side. One day I can let go and you're going to be okay. You're going to be strong enough to stand on your own. So it's okay to be attached to someone first, but let's not make a career out of it. Amen? But this happens only so that you stop being high maintenance. It happens only when you are discipled by another human being. Jesus will not disciple you directly. He will work through a human being because he said, go and make disciples. And he was not talking to himself. He was talking to human beings. And the third is maturity. You cannot get to maturity without first being planted, coming to the kingdom, and being committed to a local church. And then you cannot become more fruitful without being discipled through your care group or being mentored one-on-one. -on -one. Now, maturity is very important because only the mature can multiply. You can get a little boy... And that little boy is complete. He has everything he needs for life. Ten fingers, two eyes, one nose, right? Two ears, one mouth. He's got everything. He's complete. You, you don't start out with one finger and then hope that you, get, you develop nine more somewhere along the way. He's complete. But you know what? He cannot multiply yet. He cannot get anyone pregnant and he cannot multiply. He's not ready for it yet but he's complete. Only the mature can multiply. And so that's part of the fruit that, looks, that God looks for. Where's your fruit? Where are your disciples? Or are you still a little kid? 30 years old, 20 years old, but still wearing diapers because you're not multiplying. You're still high maintenance. Okay? We need to move on. Look at this, in Genesis 1.28, then God blessed them and God said to them, Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. In other words, you have the DNA to multiply. You have. It's in you. God put it. He spoke into you and said, be fruitful. Notice fruitfulness comes before multiplication. You cannot multiply until you are first fruitful. So God is committed to bless you so you can be fruitful 
and then bring you to a place of multiplication. And then he says, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish. The word dominion means to exercise influence. So he wants you now to multiply, exercise influence, godly influence, by spreading the kingdom of God instead of you being influenced by the world. And say, this is how we do things in the kingdom. You don't have to be corrupt in business to get ahead. Because I'm not relying on my wits. I'm relying on the blessing of God, on the favor of God. Dr. Mike Murdoch of the Wisdom Center said, and he saw it in the scriptures, it's in the scriptures, one day of favor is better than a thousand days of labor. All you need is just one connection, that one idea, and it can change the trajectory of your life. One day of favor. So fruitfulness comes before multiplication. See, God doesn't just want to add to your life. He wants to multiply. He gave us the DNA for multiplication. That's His will. In other words, the sign that you are maturing is that you are multiplying. You are exerting godly influence on everything and everyone in your life in a nice way. You don't become obnoxious and everywhere you go, you need to be born again. You need to get saved. You need to, you're going to hell. You, know? you don't want to be a pain. No, the Bible says that the kingdom of God, you know where the kingdom of God is because there will be righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Amen? So don't be obnoxious. Exerting godly influence, your family, friends, schools, business associates, your jobs, you know, all of that. Exerting godly influence. Now, how does God mature us? Okay, quickly, I want to show you something here. I love this. I was so excited last night when God showed this to me, or the other day. In Psalm 23, we all know Psalm 23. Most of us even memorized Psalm 23. The first thing we see in Psalm 23 is growth. The Lord is my shepherd, that means I'm now in the kingdom, I shall not want. True growth starts in the kingdom of God. Amen? You got to be planted. Okay? A shepherd guides his flock. Second is fruitfulness. Verses 2 and 3. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So you see now he's making you fruitful. He's bringing a lot of healing from the brokenness that the world just destroyed us. We are so broken, it's not funny. Now God is in the business of restoring us. Okay? He plants us by the water so that your, your roots will be properly nourished and you produce fruit in its season. And the third is maturity. And this is where it starts. Yea, though I walk... In the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. That's where it starts. That's where it starts. But look what happens. If you manage to cross verse 4 into verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me every single day of my life and I shall dwell in your house, in your presence forever. See, that's His promise. But you, gotta, you have to get past verse 4. Don't stop there and build a house because He says, though I walk through. You're just going through. The road to maturity is most interesting because you cannot escape the valley of the shadow of death. Here's the thing. It's just a shadow. It's not death. It's just a shadow. Don't be afraid of shadows. I saw this cute video of this little girl walking, probably one and a half years old, and suddenly realizes she has a shadow. And she was running away from her shadow because it was scaring her. The problem is the shadow was following her everywhere. <laughs> I thought it was cute, but if you're 20 years old and you're still doing that, that's not cute anymore, okay? Turn to your neighbor and just say, hindi ka na cute. 
Don't be afraid of shadows. All this pressure you're feeling now, shadows. Shadows, they're all shadows. You're, you're praying for financial breakthrough. That financial pressure you're feeling, shadow. That health issue, shadow. They're all shadows. There's the verse that says, I will not die, but I shall live and declare the goodness of my God in the land of the living. So you stand, Lord. You said, I'm standing on this. You said. If nobody will encourage you, encourage yourself in the Lord. That's what David did. The thing about the shadow of death is that it feels like death. It hurts like death. But remember this. You're a tree. Sorry, you were a seed. Seeds are not buried. They're planted. You bury the dead. And you know what? They stay dead. Zombies don't exist. Except in the movies and TV. There are no zombies. They will not come out of the ground. They are dead. They will stay there. But you're not dead. You're a seed. You're coming out of the ground. Amen? Your stay in the ground is temporary. The seed will outlive the soil. It will outlive its burial ground, its burial place, because you are not buried. You are a living sacrifice, the Bible says. Amen? Which means you are alive. You're not dead. You're alive. But the thing about being buried and being planted is that they feel the same. And it's so tempting to listen to the devil who will say, you're buried. It's over. You're not getting your breakthrough. You're not getting your church building. Your church is not going to grow. You're not going to get your healing. Your husband's not going to come back to you. He found someone else. And you're standing what God has put together. Let no man put asunder. I'm calling my husband back. I'm calling my wife back in the name of Jesus. And you call and you call and the devil says, He doesn't love you anymore. Forget it. He loves someone else. She chose someone else. You're a lousy husband feels like you're buried but you're planted don't ever forget that turn to your neighbor and just say you're just planted you're coming out amen you're coming out the difference see being buried and being planted they feel the same but there's a very big difference being buried is permanent being planted is transient you're just, you just need the ground. You need to be underground just for a while. But most of your life will be above the ground. Above your circumstances. Amen? Amen. Amen. The dealings of God are never permanent. It will end. There will be days of joy. Yes, it might be painful. Yes, it will be scary. But you need not fear because you are not alone in the valley. I shall fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And I will be surrounded by enemies. Yes, but you know what? In the presence of my enemies, God will feed me. He will prepare a table. He will vindicate me. Amen? Expect it. Expect it for your life. But see, like I said, being blessed or even being more fruitful, that's not the goal. Because if you're grapes, God is not interested in more grapes. He wants you to produce more grapes, but not because He wants more grapes. He wants wine. Because when you leave grapes by themselves, they rot, they spoil. But when it's converted to wine and you leave it by itself, its value increases. 
the flavor becomes so much richer because it's wine. It's no longer just grapes, fruitful. He wants wine. He never said, and your grapes will overflow. He said, and your wine will overflow. But here's the thing. The grapes have to be crushed to produce wine. Otherwise, all you'll have are raisins. And he did not say, and your raisins shall overflow. No, he wants wine. So now he will have to crush. And sometimes that feels worse than the valley of the shadow of death. Because the valley of the shadow of death, it may smell like the devil, but the crushing, that smells of God. You can't blame the devil for the crushing. That's God through and through. Because the devil will never increase your value. He wants to destroy you. He wants you to rot on the vines. He wants your fruit to fall to the ground before it's seasoned. That's what the devil wants. But Jesus is faithful to make you wine. But he will crush and it hurts. It hurts. But you can't turn wine, grapes into wine without crushing. And God takes a risk. Because when He starts to crush, you might walk away. And you might accuse Him of abandoning you and forgetting you. But He never left you. He's the one that does the cr crushing in the wine press. If you've seen the wine presses of the time of Jesus and the times of Elijah and the times of Samuel, it's a, it's a press that I wish I just got a picture of it. It's a press and there's this huge millstone. They put all the olives or the grapes there. And there's usually a person or a bull that just tied to that thing and it walks around and that heavy stone just crushes all the grapes and crushes all the olives and it hurts literally it's a valley so that stone stays in its place and the grapes cannot fall out of the crushing place he keeps you there and it feels like dying and yes oftentimes it is but the Lord doesn't want you dead. He wants you profitable. He wants you useful and pliable in His hands. That's what He wants. And that's why He said, and I go back and end with the first passage I started with in Genesis chapter 12. He says, I will bless you and you shall, not you might, you shall be a blessing. How much? All the families of the earth shall be blessed through you. Now, either God is lying or He wants to bless you this much. But you got to go through the pruning and you got to go through the crushing. And yes, it hurts. But God is faithful. He knows what He's doing. Amen. He knows what he's doing. Trust him. You will come out of this and you will come out stronger than ever. So trust him. If your breakthrough is not coming yet, that's okay. That's okay. Trust that God is faithful. Amen. Right now, you know what? I just want to I want to pray for you. Some of you, you know, thank God for the breakthroughs that we started receiving during our fast, but let me tell you something. God told me, patikim lang yan. That's not it yet. There are more. There is more for you. Amen? But some of us, we just need a little bit more pruning, a little bit more crushing, because if not, the blessings are going to destroy us, and He doesn't want that. He wants you to control the blessing so that it's channeled properly. Amen? But some of you are going through some pruning right now and some of you are going through some crushing right now. And if that's you, I just want to pray for you. 
I want you to stand. If you are going through some kind of pruning or crushing, or pruning and crushing, sometimes you can't tell the difference. It feels the same. But if you're going through that right now, I want to pray for you. I want to stand with you. I want to pray for hope. Because God is faithful. He really is. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray right now. Your people, these are your people, your trees of righteousness. We are a planting of the Lord. You are faithful. And as we grow, you will prune that we might bear more fruit. And once we are fruitful, it's thrown into the wine press. And there we are crushed, trodden under feet, sometimes feeling rejected in all this. But you are working out something in us, something so good, so awesome. We may not feel it right now. We may not see it right now. But we know you are still faithful. We know this. And so we will come out of this. And we will be more blessed than ever. But there will be a maturity to our blessing, a maturity to our character, so that we will not be consumed by the blessing because you are faithful and so father in the time of crushing and in the time of pruning for these your people I pray Lord that you will strengthen them speak to them encourage them and let them know that they are not alone and that they will outlive and outlast the time of crushing because you're after wine not just to crush us for the sake of crushing but to produce new wine and so Lord thank you for the crushing it might be difficult to thank you at this time but thank you for the crushing thank you for the pruning because you are the master gardener and we will come out of this far better and once we are wine, then we can truly be a blessing and bring joy. Your word says that wine maketh the heart merry. And there will be joy that will come out of us. Joy that is contagious. Joy that will influence and turn the atmosphere of death and gloom. And we don't have to compromise. We don't have to be influenced by the world. Because we belong to the great influencer, the unchanging changer. And so thank you. Thank you, Lord. Bless your people, O oh God. Bless them. Let them know that they are going to come out of this well. I pray for strength. Not just physical strength, but strength on the inside. Strength to with, with, withstand this storm that they're facing right now. Storms always end. And the sun still rises every morning. The sun is as faithful as you. It rises every morning telling us there's always a new day. Always a new day. And so it might be night right now. But the sun will rise again. We will see the sun rise again on our health, on our marriage, on our families, on our children, on our parents, on our, on our businesses and jobs, our careers. The sun will rise again, oh Lord. And you will be exalted. And so we thank you bless your people we are blessed we are blessed but bless us again oh lord enlarge our tent father that we may not cause pain and i thank you father i declare a blessed week ahead i declare your goodness your mercy your strength your favor your joy 
your shalom, your peace, O Lord, upon everyone, even those watching on the video, I declare God's peace over you, His joy and His strength to be your portion even now. I speak life. I declare it in Jesus' name. And of all of God's trees of righteousness said, Amen and amen and amen.